This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Saudi Arabia stops issuing visas to people from the DRC, fearing Ebola spread during the Hajj pilgrimage. Tunisia declares seven days of mourning as the Electoral Commission sets September the 15th for a presidential election. And survivors recount a Boko Haram raid that left two dead and dozens injured in Nigeria's Ebola state. Hello and welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. We'll bring you the details on those stories in just a moment. But first, Ramanyang with the day's business headlines from. That's right, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. Tanzania to sell a million tons of maize, grain and flour to Kenya to alleviate a prevailing food shortage. And British Airways has resumed flights to Cairo. We'll explore those stories and plenty more coming up in the course of the hour. For now, though, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we begin the hour with the latest on the Ebola outbreak. Saudi Arabia has stopped issuing visas to people from the Democratic Republic of Congo, citing the Ebola epidemic. Some Congolese Muslims have been planning to take part in the annual Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca next month. But a letter from the Saudi Foreign Ministry to the DRC's embassy in Riyadh says the kingdom has made the decision to in order to protect pilgrims and others. Earlier this month, the World Health Organization declared the year-long Ebola outbreak in the DRC a public health emergency of international concern. However, it advised against imposing travel restrictions. More than 1,700 people have died so far in this second worst Ebola outbreak in history. Saudi Arabia also suspended visas during the previous Ebola outbreak in West Africa a few years ago where more than 11,000 people died. Well, let's cross over to Chris Ochamringa. He's in Kinshasa for us. Chris, any reactions from the DRC on this decision to deny visas to those who wish to travel to Saudi Arabia? Well, there's no official reaction, but I've spoken to some officials from the president's office, and they were disappointed with this decision by Saudi Arabia to ban people from the DRC from entering their country. They're saying this decision goes against the World Health Organization's recommendation for countries to allow trade and travel. I mean, not to restrict uh, people, uh, the world, from uh, uh, allowing Congolese, you know, to go to their countries. They were requesting that they should just step up surveillance at their borders, points of entry, so that people can be screened uh, and, and the, the disease should not be spread across the country. But they also realize that, I mean, this is something that is at the discretion of uh, countries that are sovereign states. They take decisions basing on what they think is best for their country. But then they just hope that it will not be applied by other countries around the world. Chris, uh, paint for us a picture about those who might potentially be affected by this decision by Saudi authorities. Well, it's mainly Muslims. Now, the DRC is predominantly a Catholic, uh, I mean, has Catholics. It's, it's most of the people here are Catholics. About 3% of the country is, uh, <clears throat> has Muslims. And so these are the people who are expected to travel to uh, Saudi Arabia next month for the, the pilgrimage, which is an obligation that Muslims take every year. And they are the ones who are largely going to be affected by this decision. But it does not only affect Congolese citizens, it's also people who are coming from the DRC. The Saudi Arabia government says, you know, everyone who's currently in the DRC is a potential threat to the spread of this uh, outbreak and they want to protect the, the pilgrims who are going to be there. And so this, this is going to be quite a small number of people who normally travel to Saudi Arabia. Well, it is more than a week, though, Chris, uh, since the World Health Organization declared a DRC Ebola outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. How different are things on the ground now after this uh, declaration? Well, first of all, there's a new team of uh, health experts who are coordinating this response uh, together with uh, the international community. It's uh, led by... Uh, 
a very experienced professor known, in, known as Jean-Jacques Muyembe. Uh, he's one of the people who conducted the first investigation of the Ebola outbreak in 1976. And they're coming up with new strategies. They're saying that the existence of very many foreigners in, these, in North Kivu and Ituri province has created a problem. You know, there's mistrust. The communities don't trust the, the foreigners. And so they're going to be training more locals who speak the local language in carrying out surveillance, vaccination, and doing the other things that the, the foreign health workers have been doing so that there's, there's, there's that trust that is built among them. And that is number one. Two is that <clears throat> there's more money that is going to be, to be put in this outbreak over the next six months. Uh, we are expecting very soon uh, the international community and the DRC government to announce the strategies that they're going to come up to strengthen this response to the outbreak. And also there has been a st uh, scale up of the surveillance around Goma, North Kivu and Ituri province and all the areas around those, uh, those uh, particular provinces, I mean those cities where people keep traveling to and from. So they are, they've put a number of health checkpoints to ensure that people who are sick do not cross to other places and, 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 and uh, transmit this highly infectious disease. Chris Ochamringa joining us there live from Kinshasa. The Tunisian government has declared seven days of mourning following the death of Beji Kaib Esebsi. Flags at state institutions will be flown at half-mast. The statement's body left the military hospital in Tunis on Friday. Esebsi's funeral ceremony will take place on Saturday in the presence of several foreign heads of state. As Tunisia's first democratically elected president, condolences for him have been pouring in from the region and beyond, with nearby Algeria and Mauritania declaring three days of mourning. Mohamed Enashio, who was the head of parliament, was sworn in as interim president late Thursday. According to the Independent Electoral Commission, he will lead the country until presidential elections are held on September the 15th. Up to 150 migrants have died in a shipwreck off the Libyan coast. According to the United Nations estimates, about 145 migrants were rescued by the Libyan Coast Guard. Latest figures show more than 600 people have lost their lives on the Mediterranean crossing this year. Ashtatol has more details on the shipwreck as well as the international reaction. It's the worst Mediterranean tragedy to happen this year. Shortly after leaving Libya's coast heading towards Italy, a boat carrying hundreds of migrants capsized. The passengers were rescued by the Libyan Navy and local fishermen. But before help came, some migrants struggled in the water. In the afternoon, we searched from Libya to Italy, but when we went, uh, after one hour, the ship started to sink. And uh, most of them sunk it. And we risked ourselves. And no one can help us. And no one can came to risk us. The Syrian in a big problem. So we need your help. The migrants were taken to homes where they'll be returned to a migrant detention center. Migrants have reported abuse and inhumane conditions at Libyan detention centers. The current treatment and handling of migrants and refugees has garnered debate on the global stage. We must now see a change in approach to the situation in Libya and the Mediterranean that has as its core saving lives as a priority. We must see more search and rescue boats operating on the Mediterranean, uh, as well as the immediate release of people from these detention centers in Libya, uh, and for states to help us evacuate refugees out of Libya to safety. EU countries such as Italy have taken a hardline stance towards the problem of migration. But France's Emmanuel Macron is echoing the UN's call for a change of strategy. Faced with this situation, I draw several conclusions. The first is an explicit demand from France to the Libyan authorities to put an end to the detention and the situation which has developed on the ground with regards to these populations and to allow, in cooperation with the Office of High Commissioner for Refugees, the International Organization for Migration and all the other actors, these people who are in transit, who are waiting, to be returned to safety according to the protocols which have already been laid out by the organizations I mentioned. Despite the dangers, Libya continues to be a hub for migrants and refugees 
looking to reach Europe. Astatal, CGTN. At least two people were killed and dozens sustained injuries following an attack by Boko Haram militants on a camp of internally displaced persons in Nigeria's northeastern Bono state. CGTN's Brian Toussaint has the details. Local officials in Nigeria say Boko Haram militants gained entry into the Delori IDP's camp on motorbikes late on Thursday. Eyewitnesses say the militants were shooting heavily at the residents. Out of nowhere, we started to hear shooting into the air, so we started running away from the camp. Some people who couldn't run were killed. They took our food and then destroyed the shop. Security troops who responded to the attack engaged the militants in a gunfight which lasted for about a half an hour. At least two people were killed and several others wounded in that crossfire. Attacked the Danuri camp due to the keep on the boot. That is why they penetrate and enter the camp and all the people in the camp, they just run away. Dolori Camp is about 15 kilometers from regional capital, Metaguri. It houses about 50,000 people in makeshift dwellings. Boko Haram attacked the camp after pushing out soldiers at a nearby military base. The militant group launched attacks in Nigeria's northeast a decade ago. Its agenda is to maintain a caliphate in the most populous African country. Brian Toussaint, CGTN. Sudan's opposition groups have agreed to share some positions in the country's transitional government at talks in Addis Ababa. Small armed groups will now be part of the sovereign council of the interim government that has been agreed on by civilians and the Sudan's ruling military council. Political parties, civil society members and small armed movements from Sudan have been in meetings in Addis Ababa for two weeks. CGTN's Coletta Wanjohi reports from Addis Ababa. Opposition parties have agreed that those groups that had been left out during the signing of the transitional government will now be included in the process. Of the five slots given to the civilians in the Sovereign Council, two will be occupied by small armed groups. The major disagreement between the parties had been on the structure of the transitional government expected to guide the country to civilian rule. The small armed groups that were not involved in signing of the political agreement for transitional government wanted a return to peace before the formation of a government. But other parties have said a governance structure needs to come first to guide the way towards peace. The parties have also agreed that exiled groups that fled Sudan during Omar el-Bashir's regime be allowed back to Sudan. Another meeting of Sudanese parties is expected to start in Addis Ababa on 27th July. This will be between the civilian opposition and a faction that has split away from the military faction called SPLM North. The aim will be to convince the SPLM North to support the transition government. A political agreement between civilians and military to form a transitional government was signed on 17th of July, but a structure of power and roles is yet to be put in place. Koleta Anjohi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And in neighboring South Sudan, the government now says President Salva Kiir is ready to meet opposition leader Riek Mashar this month, but that the meeting should be in South Sudan. This comes as the UN, the African Union and the East African regional body IGAD all say the two former rivals should meet regularly before November to try and push the country's peace process forward. CGTN's Patrick Oyet sat down with President Kiir's spokesperson, Aten Wek Aten. Here is the interview. I don't think there is any scheduled meeting uh, between the president and the opposition leader anywhere outside South Sudan. Uh, the president is traveling to Addis on the invitation of His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Dr. Rabi Ahmed. And, he, and there is no uh, any scheduled meeting between him and Riyak Machar. There was a proposal that the meeting should take place in Juba, in South Sudan. What happened to that proposal? Well, it is Dr. Riyak who is not willing to come to Juba. And uh, the agreement had it that he should be in Juba. And some people say that he is concerned about his security. What do you say about that? His advanced team is here, his deputy is here, his wife, 
and the little changes here. And this should have spelled out clear to the Toriak that he is coming to Cuba. Will be the same as these are the senior officials of the I.O. in Cuba. By setting up conditions, uh, you know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't seem to help the implementation of his agreement very much. Because uh, as a leader, he should break all this deadlock and come to Cuba. When he comes to Cuba, President Skiri is willing to meet him. Could you just tell us how committed is President Salva Kiir to the current peace agreement? President Salva Kiir is the most committed person among all the, uh, the stakeholders, among all those who have signed his agreement. Because he is the incumbent president. Apart from his national love for peace, he is the incumbent president. He wanted to continue to govern a country that is peaceful. And so his prime concern is to see that South Sudan return to normalcy so that he could continue as a president of a peaceful country. So President Sanfakir is the most committed person. He's only let down by those who don't think viewed just personal. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. We focus on the two top men leading the anti-corruption war in Kenya. And the 7th WWF Living Planet Conference underway in South Africa to discuss the world's big food challenges. Africa, the most iconic wildlife destination in the world. Its unique ecosystems were formed over countless eons. Many people can only dream of visiting this natural paradise. But now, for the first time ever, CGTN Wild Wonderland live show is bringing Africa to you through all of our online platforms. 14 episodes from July 22nd to 28th take you to adventure through the Great Plains of Kenya's Masai Mara, the Serengeti in Tanzania, and the Greater Kruger Park in South Africa. Welcome aboard the wildest ride of a lifetime. This is Wild Wonderland live show only on CGTN. Details of the country. Find your voice. The UN's weather agency is warning that record breaking temperatures will become more frequent in the near future due to climate change. What's significant is that normally when you get a temperature record broken, it's by a fraction of a degree. What we saw yesterday was records being broken by two, three, four degrees. It was absolute. She added that climate change has made the record-breaking 2018 UK summer 30 times more likely by 2050. In Paris, the temperature reached 42.6 degrees Celsius one afternoon, while passing the 40 Celsius mark in Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. The UN's weather agency also voiced concern that the hot air which produced the extreme heat wave is headed towards Greenland where it could contribute to increased melting of ice. The outgoing president of the European Commission has held a phone talk with Britain's new prime minister after Boris Johnson took office. Jean-Claude Juncker reaffirmed the EU stance on Brexit. President Juncker listened to what Prime Minister Johnson had to say and reiterated the EU's position that the withdrawal agreement is the best and only agreement possible in line with the European Council guidelines. The spokesperson said Juncker mentioned he was still open to ideas from the UK, provided they are compatible with the withdrawal agreement. Boris Johnson has insisted the current withdrawal deal and arrangements regarding the Irish border were not good enough and had to be renegotiated. Johnson has pledged to take the UK out of the bloc on October the 31st, even if it means leaving without a transitional deal. 
The arrest of the Treasury Minister in Kenya and a host of his juniors has once again shifted debate to the corruption investigations in Kenya. Leading these investigations are two men with contrasting backgrounds. One is a son of a senior political leader in Kenya, while the other is an offspring of urban poor parents who grew up in one of the slums in Nairobi. However, their unity in the fight against corruption has put them on the local and international map. Here CGTN's Uche Okoronkwa with a tale of Kenya's director of public prosecutions and the head of the country's investigating agency. Growing up as a son of a senior administrator in Kenya, Nuruddin Haji had all the best that life could offer. His father is currently a senator. On the other end of life was George Kinoti. His life a total contrast from Haji's. He grew up in one of the slums in the Kenyan capital of Nairobi, where life was tough. Me, I've come from the lowest of the society. That's why I was picked as a child, brought up by a mission. I have no idea where my money for my education came from, up to and including to the university. So when I look back and they say, let's see, our country is in plenty. And all the resources of this country are consolidated for the good of Kenyans. If I did not have somebody who sympathized to pick me and under sponsor, all the way in Europe, in Italy, actually, you have to be specific, to take care of me. But when knowing we have this country, everything, free education, free health, and all that, but I see the amount of money, you can see the amount of money we have, which actually is not little money. It can run. This country, absolutely, it's going to individual people's pocket. Then you come and put me in the same bad wagon to deprive these people again. Where I've come from? Who are they crying to? Haji would join the Kenyan intelligence and later be appointed as director of public prosecutions, a post he currently holds. George, on his part, would rise through police ranks and head the country's criminal investigations agency. But the war on corruption has made these two gentlemen's paths cross. We do have a personal relationship as friends. That, that, that goes a long way to build that, 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 that relationship. Uh, and I think the president also has picked individuals who he believes can work together. Um, if you look at the, the, the inspector general, he's a colleague of mine. <laughs> Um, the ESCC director was a former colleague, um, and we are able to sit down and agree uh, without, ha without having tough wars <laughs> amongst ourselves. It is a unity of purpose driven by a duty to fight corruption and a dream to achieve the successful prosecution of people in high offices. In the wake of their collaboration, big names have fallen. Kenya's Minister of Finance and other senior officials at Treasury are the latest suspects to be dragged before court. But their initial crack struck at the country's National Youth Service, where over 100 million U.S. dollars was alleged to have been lost through graft. The test case was NYS, um, and quite a number of officers had to fall on the side because there were, the, you know, the, there were still those old frictions and silos. Uh, and we had to then uh, build a, a team that um, would gel them together. Uh, and we've managed to do that. That's the reason we say we are rejuvenated, we have been renewed, and more or less it's a renaissance as far as the DCI is concerned. Because now the DPP is part and parcel of us. Since then, these two men and their teams have instilled fear in the hearts of many. He is the first uh, DPP, I can say, mm -hmm. who is a polished feed officer. Mm -hmm. And um, investigations, he knows very well because he was uh, by capacity of his uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. He was an investigator, mm -hmm. in as much as he was in the intelligence. Mm -hmm. He was an operational man. Mm -hmm. This guy has commanded <laughs> good operations, which mm -hmm. even we did together. Whether these two will see the end of corruption in the East African nation, only time will tell. Ucheo Koronkwo, CGTN.
The Seventh World Wildlife Fund for Nature Living Planets Conference is currently underway in Pretoria, South Africa. It is a collaboration of chefs, farmers, civil society, scientists, government and business. The conference explores long-term solutions to the three big food challenges under nutrition, overnutrition, and the environmental degradation and climate impact from food production and consumption. Here's CGTN's Elisa Jamela with more. According to experts here in this conference, humanity has lost the sense of connection to one of the greatest sources of human nourishment and planetary health, our food choices. In the last 50 years, the production preparation and packaging of food have changed dramatically due to new technologies as well as social and cultural shifts. The experts believe that there's a need to think holistically about long-term solutions. For instance, as South Africans move to cities and their income increases, diets also change. They eat more meat and dairy, waste more and over-rely on packaged and processed food. South Africa needs to produce 50% more food by 2050, but won't be able to deal with the three major issues without a transformative change to our food production system. The three big challenges are of undernutrition, overnutrition, and the environmental degradation and climate impact from food production. There's also the issue of food scarcity in this country, and it directly impacts food production. Also, two-thirds of all the water we use is used in food crops. Therefore, it's critical to look at food production systems that focus into water sustainability. Water is really far more important, far more precious than gold. It's something that has immediate value and it has value into the future. And they, therefore, we've got to look very, very carefully and nurture and protect the integrity of the systems that produce our water. According to celebrity chef and author Zola Nene, on this African continent, there's a tendency to neglect what is originally ours and that which nurtures our indigenous resources. For me, the goal and, you know, the, the goal of being at the Living Planet Conference this year is to just talk more about indigenous produce and just make it front of mind for up and coming chefs, for um, you know fellow food lovers, just so that we, we are eating from home soil. Because my grandmother always instilled in me that um, what's grown at home is what's best for you, what nurtures you the most. So yeah, I think that we should be um, talking more about indigenous produce and make it making it more accessible so that it is front of mind. Food insecurity also decreases the ability of countries to develop their agricultural markets and economies. Business must also lead in ensuring that the GDP of this country, the size of this economy grows. Because if the economy is not growing very soon, we'll be talking about the redistribution of poverty, not the redistribution of wealth. All and sundry here agree that it's critical for all to maintain a nature the connection to one of the greatest sources of human nourishment and planetary health, food. Yuli Sanjamela for CGTN in Pretoria, South Africa. Meanwhile, in South Sudan, nomadic herders and a farming community have agreed to share land and water points. Two sides signed a pact after attending a cross-border migration conference. Here, CGTN's Daniela Pearson. There are frequent disputes over resources in South Sudan's North Upper Nile region. But the latest attempt to resolve one long-standing intercommunal conflict has proven fruitful. Nomadic pastoralists and a farming community have signed an agreement to share land and water points. How can we coexist? It is only when there is security and by protecting yourselves, then it is your responsibility. If any problem arises between you and the defender, don't shoot and don't create any problems with them. The pact aims to resolve a number of contentious issues. The host community has agreed to reduce the taxes they charge for allowing pastoralists cattle to graze. From the herders' side, they will be ensuring grazing is conducted in designated areas and that their animals are vaccinated. These nomadic tribes have also agreed to respect the norms and traditions of the host communities. The resolution that we have agreed upon and passed, if really followed and implemented, then there won't be any problems again from our side as the nomads. The resolution is between us and our brothers in South Sudan. 
For years, herders have grazed their animals in Algal Hak, a remote town near the White Nile. They travel long distances with their animals, enticed by the lush pastoral lands fed by the rainy season. However, over time, disagreements have developed between the pastoral Arab and Falata communities, as well as between pastoralists and their host communities. The conflicts happen as a result of cattle crossing into our farmland and destroying our crops. If the cows move away from the farms, then we don't have a problem. The crops are what we survive on, and that is where the conflict starts and people fight. Since 2017, local authorities, supported by the UN mission in South Sudan, have been engaging both sides to try and resolve their differences. Together, we shall continue to work and make sure that we achieve peaceful intercommunal relations between the nomads, the visiting nomads from Sudan and the local host community in South Sudan, in Northern Upper Nile State specifically. If respected, the agreement will allow the seasonal migratory exodus of the nomadic herders to continue. However, the movements will be controlled and monitored by South Sudanese authorities in order to reduce conflict. The local community will also continue to benefit, purchasing cows, sheep, goats and milk from the herders. Daniela Pearson, CGTN. Well, let's now go to Rama Nyang for a look at the day's business news. Rama. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up in business. Tanzania to sell a million tons of maize to Kenya in order to alleviate a prevailing food shortage. And British Airways has resumed flights to Cairo. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Tanzania is expected to sell a million tons of maize, grain and flour within a year to an East African neighbour, Kenya, in order to curb a prevailing food shortage over there. Drought in parts of Kenya has badly affected production of the staple grain. The first consignment of about 20,000 tonnes will be sold in August. However, both countries are yet to agree on final prices. Tanzania's cereals board is expected to oversee the deal. Officials from both countries are expected to meet next week to discuss the final terms of the deal. British Airways in the meantime has resumed flights to Cairo following a week-long suspension. Flight BA-155, serviced by 7879 Dreamliner, is scheduled to take off from Heathrow International in London at 16.20 GMT. In an email to Reuters, the airline said it was pleased to resume services following a thorough assessment, in its words, of security assignments. No details, however, were given about the airline security review. At the same time, the UK Foreign Ministry has not changed its travel guidelines for UK nationals travelling to Egypt. It maintains a warning that there remains a heightened risk of acts of terror against aviation, but it notes extra security measures are in place for flights departing from Egypt to the UK. All right then, quite a bit of company results coming out today, so let's run through some of them, starting with Nigerian telcos. Earnings at MTN's Nigerian business grew by more than a third in the six months to end June, thanks to new customers and higher voice and data revenues. The firm's Nigerian unit is its biggest by subscriber numbers. It reported that service revenue grew by 12.2% in the half year, as voice revenue went up by over 11%, and data revenue was up by over 31%. The company added some 3.3 million clients to its network, taking its subscriber base to 61 and a half million. 
Etel Africa's quarterly pre-tax profit has more than doubled as the telecoms company also signed up more clients. Double-digit growth in Nigeria and East Africa also boosted revenue. The company debuted on the London Stock Exchange last month and it said pre-tax profits for the quarter ending on the 30th of June rose to $167 million from $80 million a year earlier. Total revenue up by nearly 7% to $795.9 million in the quarter, boosted by a 9.3% rise in the company's customer base to 99.7 million people. Further afield, Alphabet's quarterly earnings have beat expectations, easing concerns about the short-term growth challenges facing Google, YouTube and the company's other advertising businesses. This comes even as it faces an antitrust probe from the United States Justice Department. The firm's revenue was up 19% to $38.94 billion compared to average estimates of 16.8% growth. Net income, $9.95 billion from $3.2 billion. Alphabet generates about 85% of its revenue from tools used in online advertising or the ad space itself. And finally, Amazon reported second quarter profits that were below analysts' estimates as the world's biggest online retailer spent more money on faster delivery of packages to Prime members. Net sales were up 20% to $63.4 billion in the quarter. Operating expenses surged by 21% to $60.32 billion as it invested $800 million in its one-day delivery program. Net income up nearly 4% to $2.6 billion. US dollars. Now then, let's come back to the continent. South Africa's recently introduced carbon tax has set industry players scrambling to determine exactly what their exposure will be and how much they would owe tax authorities. One sector that was more than a little anxious is a coal mining sector. Here's CGTN's Angela Coppola with a report on their reaction. The coal sector is already a little anxious, with pressure mounting from environmentalists to stop mining and burning coal to reduce the impact of human-created climate change. But it appears that the tax implications are minimal. For most mines, the impact will be on the cost of diesel. On the 5th of June, the cost of diesel went up by 5 cents a litre. Um, if you consider the normal fluctuations in diesel price, it's actually very, very, very low. Five cents on 14 rand pump price is not one move the needle. The majority of the impact will be felt by the coal burners. In this instance, ESCOM and Sassel are the two biggest losers, or perhaps not. The scope two uh, taxes will be on ESCOM. And what are they going to do with it? They will have to pass it on to the consumers, all of us, and the mining sector in general. Um, so that would be like that, that you can't claim back. And that's the other thing that we're worried about. Drilling down into the detail, there were concerns about methane gas. On electricity, there will be no impact of carbon tax up to December 2022. Um, so carbon tax won't have an impact there. Open cast coal mines have got no fugitive methane emissions that they can pay tax on. Um, there may be some tax on fugitive mine methane from underground mines, but that will not be a lot. It's actually a very small amount. One expert expects an impact on coal demand by the year 2030. The biggest impact is on the, the consumers of the coal. So on certain assumptions, um, the carbon tax will increase the cost of burning coal um, to the guy who burns the coal at about 10%. Um, and in a worst case scenario, by 2030, the cost of burning coal will go up by about 25%. Um, and, and so that may impact on the demand for coal. The uncertainty about the offsets and the uncertainty about what happens into the future longer than two years uh, onto the, uh, when, when the, the really emitters, Sassel and, and Eskom and, and those are, are hitting, uh, will be hitting the, the higher taxes. Where will it go to? It will go to consumers and the coal mining industry is, is one of them. The impact of the carbon tax on the coal mining industry in South Africa is going to be limited. Everything's going to rest on the coal burners, the likes of ESCOM and Sassel. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we're still in South Africa where the American car maker Ford is increasing its investments in the country. It's spending an additional $215 million over there to ramp up production. Now, the move is expected to create over 1,000 new jobs with an additional shift. Nissan and BMW also recently increased their output in South Africa. With all the uncertainty around Brexit, some of the large global car makers have moved part of their operations out of the UK. Here's CGTN Sumitra Naidu with the latest data. 
The Ford Motor Corporation wants to increase production in South Africa. It's preparing to add a new shift that will create 1,200 jobs to its local workforce of 4,300 people. South Africa boasts a high standard in motor manufacturing and continues to receive solid foreign investment. Reliability and repeatability is very important and all our investment was mainly focused at that and also um, making sure that we can build the vehicle in line with the standard bill of process that they use all over the rest of the world. The additional shift will start in August and will be focused on the Ford Ranger and Everest models. While the vehicles are a popular buy in South Africa, they're also being manufactured for the export market. The Ranger is ranked as the top-selling pickup in Europe. 70% of what we manufacture here is for the export markets. So it is, I would say, the most important product going into Europe at this stage for Ford Motor Company. Obviously, they keep us very close and they make sure that we stick to our targets and numbers as well. But it is absolutely fantastic just to have a market like that that we can feed into that continues to grow. Ford SA has production plants in Port Elizabeth in the eastern part of the country and in Pretoria, north of Johannesburg. The plants will now run 24 hours, increasing production to 720 units per day from 506 vehicles currently. Ford exports its vehicles to 148 countries across the globe. A third of all local production is sold here in South Africa and into other sub-Saharan African countries. Sumit Renadu, CGT in Johannesburg, South Africa. One final story for you. Representatives from China and Mali have signed a memorandum of cooperation on the Belt and Road Initiative in Mali's capital. Now, the countries will strive to work together on major strategic policies as well as infrastructure projects and trade. The BRI essentially aims to boost connectivity between countries to facilitate easier trade, financial, social and cultural integration. It is a very promising initiative and I must say, if you had to think about it, it is awesome. President Xi Jinping had this idea and it proves once again that Chinese leadership is not only economic and political today, it is also moral and cultural. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Next year marks the 60th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between China and Mali. Mali has successfully joined the Belt and Road Initiative. It has laid a new foundation and injected new vitality to the higher level development of China-Mali relations. The development of Mali is not easy. It is located inland and has challenges in many aspects. There should be a process for understanding and participating in the initiative. I think we have to uphold the right approach to justice and interest raised by President Xi Jinping and create more development opportunities for Mali. And I'll leave you there for the time being. I'll be back at the top of the hour there. When we come back, we'll be looking at South Africa's tax laws. They've been amended to essentially require citizens living and working outside the country to pay taxes on their income in South Africa. Why is this happening and how exactly will it work? We'll explore that live from Joburg at 1800 GMT. See you then. For now, though, back to Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And uh, we still have more news for you here on the programme. Here's what's ahead. Break dancing for positive change in Uganda's capital, Kampala. Nigeria is my home. 160 million vibrant, ambitious individuals constantly seeking the perfect self-expression. It is these people who inspired me to be that person that is seen, to be a voice that is heard, and ultimately to be the anchor that I am. I have to tap in, tune in, and turn on the very best qualities within me to deliver the news. I'm Richard Nta, an anchor for CGTN. Between 2007 and 2014, the African savanna elephant population declined by 144,000 animals, decimated mainly by poaching. In Tanzania, home of the iconic Serengeti National Park, the elephant population has shrunk by 60% in five years. 
Now, in response to this environmental crisis, a new approach to wildlife conservation is being pioneered. Turning poachers into game scouts, deploying cutting-edge technology, and uplifting local communities through education and job creation. This is the story of the men and women who are working to bring the great elephant herds back to the African savannah. Africa Live. Find your voice. A dance project in Uganda's capital, Kampala, is training young people from the slums on how to break dance. The initiative hopes the discipline and skills taught needed to master the art will help keep youngsters out of trouble and make improvements to their lives. Close to 500 young people are involved in the project. CGTN's Hilary Yesiga tells us more. A windmill stroke. Apollo Manana is perfecting his break dancing. And as well as being told how to move, it's also given him some much needed motivation. Breakdance has improved, has improved my life because at first I wasn't schooling. I had stopped in senior two uh, and, I, and, I was on, I, and I was at home for, for two years. But when I joined Breakdance Project Uganda, they managed to take me back to school. Twelve-year-old Subra Natasha is not only mastering the top rock style here, but she also feels like she's become part of a community. I have learned a variety of breakdance techniques. I have also made new friends. All this keeps me away from bad habits. The dance project takes in young people between the ages of 4 and 19. They are close to 500 of them currently participating. Through breakdance, trainers here hope to produce better entertainers, but also keep these young people out of crime. According to the Uganda police, many underprivileged young people in Kampala slums end up being drawn into criminal activity. But those involved in this breakdance initiative say they've seen many people turn their lives around. Before we started uh, this program, a lot of children here would pick up things that, does not be, uh, things that do not belong to them. And then when the program started, it instilled a bit of discipline in them. And then they know it's wrong to take what does not belong to you. And there are plans for expansion. The project wants to reach out to those from slums across the country. But our goal is to, to, to use that as a tool to get them to channel their energy into something positive and something creative. And uh, so as they are learning skills uh, and, and dance techniques, we also want to focus on developing other life, very important life disciplines, things like uh, being honest, things like uh, working together. And as they master the breakdance moves, these boys and girls hope to make it onto bigger platforms and reap the rewards from their talents. Hilara Isga. CGT, Kampala. And your sports news coming up next. Here's what's ahead. The head of the Nigerian and Kenyan federations, Ibrahim Shehu Gusau and Jack Tuwe, are vying to be vice president of the IAAF. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point, only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Let's start with athletics news. The heads of the Nigerian and Kenyan federations, Ibrahim Shehu Gusau and Jack Tuwe, are vying for the position of vice president 
of the IAAF. The two are the only Africans in a short list of 11 contenders in the running to be one of the four vice presidents of the world governing body at the forthcoming council elections during the 52nd IAAF Congress in Doha. Sebastian Coe, who succeeded Senegal's Lamine Diak in 2015, will return unopposed for a second four-year term as President Shehu Gusau and Tuwe are also among the 10 Africans cleared to run for one of the 13 council members' posts during the Congress that will be held from the 25th to the 27th of September in Qatar. South Africa's youngest chess champion will soon be heading to the Commonwealth Games in India to represent her country. Seven-year-old Kajo Naidu took the junior title at home after an impressive eight out of nine wins. CGTN's Julie Shire went to meet the impressive little player. Kajo Naidu started playing chess when she was just four years old. It wasn't long before she mastered the strategic board game. I did not like going to bed at all. So I used to always play dad and I got, I got better and better against him but I always used to lose but I wanted to win and then one day I beat him. On meeting Nadu, she's a petite and sweet seven-year-old but there's nothing small about her when she calmly sweeps her opponents aside, many of them much older than her. The silent challenge of the game is what she loves most. It's not something that's loud and you can get hurt. It's calm and it's some games are easy, some games are difficult, but it always gives you a new challenge. Sometimes I do my yoga to make my brain flow during the game. She claimed the junior chess title when she won the under eight category earlier this year and the queen of chess is just getting started. I want to go until I want to stop, which is hopefully never, but I also want to become a grandmaster. So there's different stages in chess. Once you get your certain rating or you get these points, you become a candidate master. Grandmaster is the highest thing you can get, and I really want to become that one day. Naidu will represent South Africa at the Commonwealth Games in India in June. Thereafter, she heads to China for the World Cadet Championship in September. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Cote d'Ivoire International and Manchester United defender Eric Bai might be set for a longer period on the sidelines after manager Ole Gunnar confirmed the knee injury he suffered in their 2-1 win over Tottenham does not look great. Bai, who was making a successful recovery from another injury he suffered towards the end of last season, was withdrawn after only 10 minutes of being introduced as a half-time substitute. Ole has revealed that at this early stage, the prognosis does not look encouraging, with the club reported to have stepped up the chase for Leicester City's England international Harry Maguire as a replacement. It's never, uh, never nice when you get an injury and it's not worth, uh, worth it when you lose one. He's, he's done his knee, but we're not sure how bad it is. So, of course, we need to get back to Manchester and do the scans. But uh, let's just hope for the best. The All Blacks captain Kieran Reid moved swiftly to quash the idea he might be the solution to New Zealand's blindside 